Good day, physics students. Newton's second law is perhaps the most fundamental expression of macroscopically how a lot of the things in the universe work. Um, and therefore, it's worth our investigation. So, Newton's second law relates the factors that affect a system's acceleration. And one of those factors is the net force applied to the system. All right, so if you collect data um, where you keep everything about a system constant and you only vary the net force applied to that system, what you'll get is a trend of data that looks like this. That zero, zero point has to be on the graph because with a net force of zero, a system does not accelerate. So says Newton's first and or second laws. All right. And so this is a direct relationship. What we get is that acceleration, um, the magnitude of acceleration is, pro let me do this. Let me back that up. Um, now we can say that. Yeah, we can say that. We can call these both vectors. So acceleration is proportional to net force. All right. So that means mathematically proportional, but also really importantly, um, vectors A and net F always in the same direction. All right, so what will an object do under the influence of a net force? Well, it will definitely accelerate in the direction of that net force. Um, well, the nature of the proportional or direct relationship. This says that A is, when I say A is proportional to, proportional to net F, that means that A and net F are directly related. And you notice I'm saying net F and I'm saying net F. Two just different notations for the idea of the total of all the forces acting on an object. So what's the nature of a direct relationship? Well, if there is, um, for some force F, a system accelerates at a rate A. Well, the direct relationship means by whatever factor you change F, or well, I should say, by whatever factor you change one quantity, the other quantity changes by the same factor. So, for example, a simplest one would be with twice the net force, you get twice the acceleration. Or um, how about uh, at one-sixth the net force, you get one-sixth the acceleration. Or at uh, you know nine point uh, nine nine point two times the force, you'd get nine point two times the oops acceleration. All right, that's the nature of the direct relationship. Um, when one quantity changes, oh boy, by a certain factor. Here's where you hit that one and a half times speed, right? Um, the other changes by the same factor. Thus a linear graph. Okay, now Newton's second law also, well, in relating the factors that affect a system's acceleration, when a constant net force is applied to systems of different masses, what you get is something that looks uh, generally, um, generally like this. Don't draw, don't draw yet. I'll tell you why. And that suggests, suggests that A is inversely proportional to mass. So, at a constant net force, or when the same force is applied to varying, or to masses of varying, to systems of varying masses, thank you, you get something that, a graph that looks like this, and what mathematically is true is that there is an inverse relationship between a system's mass and its acceleration. Um, this says A is inversely related to system mass. All right, so what's the nature of the inverse relationship? Well, 
some system mass m with net for with a certain net force applied to it accelerates at a rate a well here's why i said don't draw that graph yet watch this we'll make a as perfect a graph as we can here's a data point m system a that's arbitrary but here's a data point the reason i use that data point is because i can now say um well if I were to have a system of, let's say, three times the mass, the nature of the inverse relationship is when you change a quantity by a certain factor, the other quantity changes by the inverse of that factor. The 1 over 3a, or 1 third a. So we multiply one quantity by 2, we divide the other by 2, or in this case 3. So here's m. And here's A. I'm going to go, oh, crap, 3M. Uh, 3M is all the way out here. Here's 2M. Here's 3M. Right? Here's a third of A. So here's a data point. We could do um, another one. How about we do data point 1 half M? Well, we change M by a factor of 1 half. We change A by a factor of the inverse of 1 half, which is 2. So at 1 half M, right, here is 3M. At 1 half M, we get an acceleration to A, and here's a data point. And, well, it takes at least three data points to define a trend, but we could put more on here, but this is, you know, a pretty good inverse graph. Notice this, watch. When we take this data point here, here's M, here's 2M. When we go up here and we go over here, ooh, look at that. We get right between 0 and A. This is A over 2. That checks out. All right, that's the nature of the inverse relationship. When... I'll do you a favor, watch this. When one quantity changes by a certain factor, <clears throat> factor, another quantity changes by the inverse of that factor. You dig? Fair enough? Okay. Now, that gives us the mathematical relationships um, that, that dictate Newton's second law. All right. And so, I think, yeah, we should get back. Yeah, you know what? This is a reasonable, a reasonable, place, reasonable place to talk about this. Um, I'm going to come back to it. Let's go to this. Let's go to this next one. So, summarizing those two results, right? Those two results are that we can s verify experimentally that a system's acceleration is proportional to the net force applied to it, and that a system's acceleration is inversely related to the mass of that system. And you combine those two results, and you get Newton's second law, and that says, in one expression, that well that single expression meets these two criteria. And it's important for us to make sure we're aware that acceleration and net force are both vectors and thus must point in the same direction. Right? The typical useful form, you know, that you well, the form of this equation that you'll typically apply is this. Ask an engineer or a scientist what's Newton's second law, they're gonna say net F equals MA. This is the more physically accurate. It's that A depends on, acceleration depends on stuff. All right, but this is the way you'll use it, um, like in this question. Here's a worker pulls on a rope with a force to drag, a blah, blah, blah. The crate accelerates at that rate. What's the force of friction? So our first step in solving any dynamics problem, problem about forces, is a free body diagram. So my dudes know this acronym mnemonic to figure out which forces act on an object um, this object certainly weighs something that's our W 
and we typically express the magnitude of an object's weight as m times oh boy m times g. This object is being pulled and not pushed. This object is on the floor, so there's a normal force pointing upward. Um, we got the, the this object is being pulled. There's a tension force. And the question is how much friction, so there must be some friction. And we can write a net force statement to talk about what this, well, to find this friction force. Now the friction force points in what I would call the x direction. Most reasonable people would, I suppose. x and y, we'll call these our positive x and positive y directions. All right, so if we want to find friction force, what is the force of friction? Well, we write a net F in the X direction. And that says T minus the friction force equals MAX. We're really explicitly saying T is positive because T points in our positive X direction. Friction force is negative because it points opposite that. All right, so algebraically, we can say that friction force is T minus M A. And we can substitute. So the friction force is T 150 Newtons minus the mass of the object is 50 kilograms times 1.8 meters per second per second. I uh, believe that's probably 90, right? Yep. 150 minus 90 force of friction is 60 newtons. All right, nice little reminder here. Look, these units apparently are newtons because we must subtract one thing in newtons from another thing in newtons to get an answer in newtons. So a good little reminder, oh yeah, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Good little trivia to have in mind um, that any any reasonable physics exam will ask. Okay, um, so procedurally, right? Net for or sorry, free body diagram is always the start to a dynamics problem. To now we can apply Newton's second law that says, I mean, if we want to be explicit. Right, net F equals MA. I usually just say I'm writing a net force statement. What I do is I write the net force statement and set it equal to MA because Newton's second law says the net F equals MA. And then you isolate the thing you want and then you substitute and solve. Okay? Okay. We can apply the ideas of Newton's second law without getting really quantitative to a case like this, a situation like this, you got a bucket of water, it's down on the bottom of a well, and you need to drag it up out of the well, pull it up with a, with a rope, obviously, it's a well. Um, and I'm going to talk about three phases here. Phase one, we get this object moving. Phase two, we keep it moving at a constant speed. Phase three, it gets to the top and we stop. Now, the bucket of water weighs 100 newtons. Okay, at any instant, what's going to happen is there's going to be, um, if this is our bucket, we've got the weight of the bucket. And then we've got some tension force applied by the rope, well, applied by the person pulling on the rope. The rope is a means by which that force is conveyed, I suppose. So, um, this force, I guess we're really calling this, this is the tension force. Let's plot the tension force. All right, how much force is required in each of these phases? All right, so we'll do like a, how about this? We got like a phase one. We got like a phase two, and we got a phase three. So this is over time, what has to happen. So, um, well, let's see. To get the bucket moving, well, to get the bucket moving, that means that we need to accelerate the bucket upward. We're going to assume that the bucket starts from rest, right? So we have like a V initial of zero and a V final going upward. And that means that we have a delta V upward. 
And that means we have an acceleration upward. And that means we have a net force upward. And that means that T has to be greater than mg. How much greater? Well, that's up to you. But if you want to get this object moving, um, well, you've got to apply more force than the object's weight. How much more? Again, that's up to you. But applying more than 100 newtons of force will make this object accelerate. And since it started at rest, it'll make it speed up in the upward direction. Now, phase two, lift this thing at a constant speed. Constant speed, well, that takes us all the way down to here. That means acceleration is zero. And that means net F is zero. And that means T has to be the same exact size as mg. So you can stop applying this extra force and now just apply enough force to keep the object moving. Newton's first law says that objects in motion tend to stay in motion. The more detailed way to say that is objects in motion will stay in motion at a constant velocity until acted on by a net external force. So this can be a misconception. Things, especially lifting things. You're telling me I don't have to, you know, use more force than an object's weight to lift it up? Well, not if you want to make it not accelerate. Okay? And then phase three, stopping this thing. We get, we get this thing to the top, now we can stop it. Well, we have, in the beginning of phase three, a velocity upward. And a final velocity in phase three of zero which means that the change in velocity is that way. It was moving upward, now it's not. The change in velocity was downward, which is to say the acceleration is downward, which is to say the net force is downward, which is to say that T must be less than mg. And so suddenly to stop this thing, we've got to do this. I'm making this wavy because that's what a real graph would look like. It would be hard to make exactly a flat line graph. Okay? Now, since this is a graph of force versus time, this is actually not bad to talk about, right? This is force versus time. This area is an impulse, is a change in momentum. That would be a positive change in momentum. This area here would be a negative change in momentum. And if you add up those changes in momentum the way that I've drawn them, the total change in momentum would be zero. And that's why, well, this thing could start at rest and end at rest because total change in momentum could be zero. If you haven't talked about momentum yet, that's okay. Kids in my classes have. Okay? Okay, um, last little thing. Great opportunity to talk about objects in free fall. And a classic question, here's an object of, you know, relatively large mass and of relatively small mass in free fall. Now, free fall means that gravity is the only force acting on an object. It means no air resistance. It means nothing else. All right, well, if we look at a free body diagram for each of these, this one has a relatively beefy weight. This one has a relatively puny weight. Which hits the ground first? Well, clearly the big one. Look at that force. However, if we write a net force statement for each object, this says mg, and I'm choosing to call this way the positive direction because I want to equals, well, M, A. Huh. Oh. A equals G. Over here, write our net F. Little M, G equals little M, A. Oh. Well, look at that. These objects have the same exact acceleration. And that acceleration is g. Now again, people in my classes have talked about the fact that g, by definition, 
is a ratio of gravitational force to mass measured in newtons per kilogram which is gravitational field strength. So we've said that our Earth's gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. All right, what that actually means or what that produces when you let an object be what's the word uh, influenced by that gravitational field is that gravitational well the acceleration that an object has is 9.8 meters per second per second so most people lots of people will talk about um, probably most people will talk about G as gravitational acceleration how fast objects will accelerate in freefall and that happens because it's specifically because the Earth's gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, right? This, because there's a lot more mass, there's a lot more force exerted on it. A lot less mass, a lot less force exerted on it. But this M is about resistance to acceleration. If we go back a few slides, we said objects with larger masses have proportionally smaller accelerations. Whoops, I'm supposed to be here. Right? Larger mass, smaller acceleration. Right? We have larger mass, okay, more force, but smaller acceleration, and we end up with the same thing. Less mass, but proportionally more acceleration, so same acceleration. So objects in free fall will fall at the same exact rate regardless of their mass. I am going to back burner this question for now. Um, this m might be out of place for, uh, for some people not in my classes. In my classes we've talked about the phenomena that um, that dictates the answer to this question, so we'll just table that one. Okay, but um, we've gotten some good um, practical experience with solving a dynamics problem with Newton's second law um, and with looking at data that can really generate Newton's second law for us in terms of the factors that affect how fast the system accelerates, and that is the nature of Newton's second law at the end of the day. That's what Newton's second law does, is it tells us why things accelerate at the rate they do. Okay? Adios.